What's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into my YouTube channel. Very glad to have you with me today. Uh, we're going to be doing a book review of an interesting book, a very interesting book. And the title of it here is Why I Preach from the Received Text. And the subtitle is An Anthology of Essays by Reformed Ministers, edited by Jeffrey T. Riddle and Christian M. McShaffrey. Very, very interesting book. Before we get into that, I want to take a moment to welcome you to my channel. Uh, again, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA, where we are, we are a Reformed, Bible-believing, Christ-preaching church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, you found one. Please come visit us on the Lord's Day, Gospel Fellowship PCA. All right, well, I've got myself inset here, screen and screen, so you can look at what I'm looking at. I've prepared a little bit of a, well, it's going to be kind of a longer review today, to be completely honest. Um, I'm not sure how long I'm going to go, maybe half an hour, maybe 40 minutes or so. I want to take an in-depth, deep dive into this book. I do think it's kind of an important book. Uh, I don't know how much, it, how much it's going to change the landscape in the Reformed world about uh, preaching and translations of the Bible and preferences of a Greek New Testament and things like that. But I do think it was interesting enough for, for me to do a deep dive review into this book. Since we've talked about Greek on this channel, we've talked about textual criticism a little bit. I've talked a little bit about the critical text, a um, little bit about the majority text on some interviews with Duane Green and others who are interested in these topics. And so I, I was very excited to read this book because I uh, honestly, I'm, I'm open to listening to other brothers on this text, on this uh, topic. Um, so I wanted to hear what they had to say, and I tried as best as I possibly could to read this book with a heart that is inclined to the Lord, uh, asking God to instruct me from wiser brothers and fathers. If there's something that I'm missing out on, I'd certainly like to know what it is. And so I kind of came to this book with eager expectations. And in all honesty, uh, for the most part, you know, I you'd think that I would really enjoy this book because three of the things that this book talks about are three things that I am particularly passionate about, namely the preaching of the gospel, uh, secondly, the Greek text of the New Testament, and third, the Reformed confessions. I am, after all, a Reformed and Presbyterian minister myself. I subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith the larger catechism, the shorter catechism, all that without any exceptions to my presbytery, the presbytery of the Ascension in my denomination, the PCA. So when I hear other brothers that are also confessional, be it Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever other stripes of authors are represented here in this book, and they also subscribe to the Confession of Faith, and they are suggesting to me that perhaps I'm using the wrong Greek text when I'm looking at the uh, the New Testament that I should be preaching from a translation based on the, the received text or the TR versus uh, the critical text or the CT, then I certainly want to, uh, to listen to that. And so there was a great amount of ex, uh, expectation and anticipation on my part to dig into this book. And uh, I will tell you this, if I'm completely honest, I, I was thrilled to read it. I, I truly enjoyed myself. I took uh, several weeks to, to read through the various chapters of, of this book. Um, in some ways, I found this book to be very persuasive and other, in other ways, I found this book to not be terribly persuasive. And so I, I figured I would do kind of an objective review here. Now, uh, as soon as I say that, I want to, I want to just be honest and say that there was another reviewer, uh, a guy by the name of Mark Ward, who is a friend of mine, who also reviewed this book. He didn't make a video, but he wrote a pretty extended Amazon review and, uh, a review on his blog. And his review was then reviewed by uh, one of the editors here, contributing editors, Jeffrey Riddle. And needless to say, fireworks ensued, okay? So Riddle called Word's review a toxic review of this book. And I just wanna be completely honest from the get-go here that I did not, and still have not to this day, read Mark Ward's review, even though uh, Mark Ward and I are friends. We've talked about these topics before a little bit. I have not read his review. And so to the extent that my review bears any similarities to his, maybe I'll read it when I'm done doing this video review, but I still have not done it yet. So if there are similarities, it's because um, two other brothers, namely Mark and I, may have similar concerns that we are expressing towards Riddle and McShaffrey and others. And so maybe they might hear those fairly objectively. The other thing I would say is that uh, it's been several months now that I did a video on why I preach from a Bible that is based on the critical text of the Greek New Testament 
And my video, I think it was about 16 minutes long, Jeff Riddle did a very long extended review of my video, more than an hour long, maybe 45 minutes to an hour of my 16 minute video. And um, he definitely gave me some promptings of things to think about. In fact, he challenged my view on the critical text and caused me to go back and do a lot more reading because I wanted to either counter his arguments or perhaps agree with his arguments in some sense. And so I ended up diving into uh, the whole area of the majority text, which is a, a third option between the TR, or the, the uh, received text, the textus receptus, or the critical text, the CT. There is another way called the majority text. And personally, at this moment, as of the filming of this video, I do find the majority text position um, to, to be quite convincing on a number of levels. So maybe we're going to get into that a little bit as we go. So this book here, Why I Preach from the Received Text, an anthology of essays from the reform, from Reformed Ministers, um, it has a couple of goals as far as I can understand and discern the meaning of this book. Uh, it is three things. First of all, it is the testimonies of other pastors and ministers within Reformed churches. Most of the authors of the essays, in fact, I think all of them, subscribe either formally by way of subscription to or at least adherence to one of the Reformed confessions. And in most cases, it's either the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is my, my confession and my denomination's confession, or the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is very similar to and derived from the Westminster Confession of Faith, albeit with some obvious differences when it comes to sacramentology uh, and ecclesiology and a few other things as well. So, so these are all from other ministers. Most of these chapters come across as testimonial. In fact, the goal of the book was to ask pastors to simply answer the question, why is it that they preach from a translation that is derived from the Textus Receptus, or the TR? And if you're not familiar with these terms, you might want to go back and do some preliminary research before going further in this video. Essentially, the Textus Receptus, or the TR, is a printed, uh, printed edition, or editions, plural, that came about in the times of the Reformation. Uh, Erasmus was the first editor or collator of the TR. Uh, various other editors bar worked from his original work in 1516. And so there are a number of different TR editions, um, including Beza and Stephanus and the Elsevier brothers putting out various editions of the text Receptus, although most of them are fairly similar um, throughout the Reformation era until um, the late 1800s when Scrivener ended up kind of polishing off the last TR edition and that one conforms very closely to the King James Version, in fact, that was actually tailored to the King James Version so that that edition of the TR would comport uh, nearly exactly with the King James Version. Um, all of that to say that the point of these essays is to explain why these ministers preach from translations, plural, but it's actually really one in this book, the King James Version. And so I'd say that that's the second thing that this book does is not only is it testimonies as to why preachers preach the way they do and from what they do, but also to encourage the use of the King James Version. And so, in fact, um, the use of the TR or the Textus Receptus is so nearly paralleled with the use of the King James Version that at times those two things become virtually indistinguishable within this particular book. Now, technically, there is a difference between the TR. The TR is Greek, okay? The Greek text, King James Version, obviously, the 1611 King James Version is in English, so they're not exactly the same thing, uh, although the King James is translated from the TR. But most of this book actually has more to do with the King James Version than it does the Textus Receptus, which is one of my complaints, which you're going to hear me mentioning as we go on through this video. The other thing then, if giving the testimonies as to why they preach from what they do and the encouragement of the use of the King James Version, if those are goals one and two, then I would say the third goal of this book is to discourage the use of other translations, namely the ESV, the New King James, the NASB, whatever other translations there may be. There's an obvious theme running through this book of discouraging ministers from preaching from the so-called modern translations. Okay, so that's kind of the big idea of what this book is up to. I will say this, I enjoyed the book. I found the chapters to be engaging. Most of them were very well written. Um, it is an easy read given the difficulty of the topic. It reads quite easily. In fact, uh, not only is the cover very beautiful, I think they did a great job with the design, but if you open up the book, uh, this is a pretty easy read. The font is huge and there's massive spacing between the lines. I actually thought I got a kid's 
book or a, a large print version here when I first look at this thing. It's not hard to read. Uh, very large prints. The chapters are very, very short for the most part. They're about 2,500 words, which runs to about 10 pages of printed uh, length each. And yet they did all that. I congratulate them on this. Um, simplifying a very difficult topic because which edition of the Greek New Testament to preach from is it extraordinarily complicated topic. You've got to deal with various uh, manuscripts. You've got 5,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament plus, including quotations from patristic fathers. You have lectionaries, you have manuscripts. Uh, within the manuscripts, you've got uncials, which are the older ones. You've got the minuscules, which are the, the newer ones. You've got various versions in Latin and Syriac, the Peshitta. You have all kinds of data that you have to distill here. And then you have to ask the question of which manuscripts are, are better. What do we mean by better? Better condition? Better in terms of their uh, completion? Are they better in terms of uh, which copy they copied? Are they better in terms of, of what? Their antiquity or their numerical preponderance? Those are all extraordinarily complicated questions. And so this book really boils it down to, um, to the question of whether or not we should preach from the Textus Receptus, the Reformation era Greek text or texts, um, Erasmus, Beza, Elsevier, Stephanus, et cetera, or should we use the critical text, the more scholarly, modern, academic version of the Greek New Testament? That is the question distilled uh, so much. Now, the way I'm going to do this is in three parts. First, I'm going to say some very positive things about this book. For the first few minutes, it's going to sound like it's a it's a flat out endorsement, like I'm some kind of a paid endorser of this book, which in fact I'm I'm not. I do have a number of very positive things to say about this book. I'm not sure what Ward had to say that was positive about the book. He might have came at it far more critically than I'm going to. I'm going to start off with a number of things that I loved about the book even. And then secondly, I'm going to kind of switch gears and I'm going to go to some negatives. These would be some things that I think that they messed up. I think they they kind of lost the plot. I think they I think they messed up in a few ways. There are a few arguments that I did not think were persuasive, uh, some less so than others, uh, some not persuasive at all. Uh, in fact, this book, one of the dangers is I do think it verges into King James onlyism in at least one chapter, um, although the authors throughout argue that they're not King James onlyists. In fact, it's called a cult a couple of times in this book. And yet there's at least one chapter that really, really verges that way. I think you'll agree with me if you read the chapter. Um, and so I'll go positive, then I'll go negative, and then I'm going to end up with a series of questions that I had that this book did not resolve for me. And so even as I'm coming at this ob as objectively as possible, trying to learn from brothers and fathers in the faith, trying to be gracious and charitable in my attitude, even when I'm reading somebody that I, I start off kind of disagreeing with or um, some of their conclusions, um, I do want to be as kind as possible. And so I'm going to end with questions that I wanted to hear. I really wanted to hear, and the authors and the editors did not give me what I needed to know to fully persuade me. So perhaps if they were to ever do a revision or a second edition or to write another book, they're going to have to answer these questions because uh, they're just big, huge gaps. Uh, there's a couple of places in this book where it's like a boat with a massive hole and it's taken on water quick. And so they're going to have to answer these questions if they want this position to be persuasive. Now they call it um, confessional bibliology, not King James onlyism, but confessional bibliology, because they're arguing that the TR, the Textus Receptus, is the Greek text that is confessional, and only that text, the TR, uh, stands in agreement with the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession of Faith, etc. I'm going to challenge that in a bit. You'll see why. First of all, let's uh, let's say some positive things about this book. I love the fact that this book argued for the stability of the text and stability of translation. I think everybody agrees that there is a certain amount of frustration with how many modern translations and versions there are. I completely agreed with the authors that every time I hear about a new translation, part of me rolls my eyes and the other part of me feels a little bit sick in my belly because... I honestly don't think we need any more new English translations. We have a, a just a plethora of English translations. Some are better than others. Some are very good. Some not so good at all. In fact, it seems like every time a new translation comes out, it gets worse than the than the previous one before it. I'm talking about things like the Message or the Passion version or the Jehovah's Witnesses New World translation. Some of these are are really really bad. They're not scholarly. They're not excellent. 
And so there's a, a strong part of me that longs for stability of text and translation. Um, I too can agree with my brothers that I, I wish that we, we could kind of focus on, and actually nobody really mentioned this, but I wish we could focus on just translating the Bible into the other languages in this world. There are thousands of languages in this world where nobody has yet done a translation, and we need to get them out there to the tribes and the peoples of, of this world. And not only that, but the constant updating of editions, I, I do think is a bit of a sales ploy. Um, I really wish, and in fact, it's one of the things I love about the King James version and the new King James, they've not done updates of these versions. There have been no substantial updates of the King James version, aside from the few tweaks that they've done from printing to printing. And yes, the King James version in 1769, I think it is, is different from the 1611. There are some places that they updated and tightened up some spelling and things like that. Essentially, though, it's a translation that, that doesn't get updated. Same thing with the New King James, have not updated the New King James, unlike the ESV, which has been updated a couple different times, unlike the NASB, which has been updated several times, unlike the NIV, which has been updated, in my mind, worse each time. Um, I long for the stability of a text and a translation. I think that I think that's fantastic. It's a good point. And not only that, but... I was really moved and a little bit provoked even when the authors challenged me about the fact that uh, verses in the King James Version um, translated from the Textus Receptus are used in our confessions, but some of those verses are the so-called missing verses in the modern translations. And so a couple of examples are the end of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 13b, and 1 John 5, 7, um, those would be verses that are cited in the Westminster Confession of Faith in their scripture proofs. But if you look at the ESV, at least in the case of Matthew 6, 13b, it's been moved to a footnote. So it's in the Bible. It's just been moved to a footnote because it doesn't appear in some of the older manuscripts of, uh, of the New Testament, namely the Alexandrian-based uh, New Testament manuscripts. It's, it's not present in those those copies. Uh, 1 John 5, 7 is known as the comma, jo, uh, the John's comma, the comma Johannium, uh, said that wrong, Johannine comma, thank you. Um, and that's not present in the ESV at all, but it is used as a uh, scriptural proof text in the Confessions of Faith. And so Dane Johansson challenged us on that, as so did Gardner. And so I've got some page numbers on here, page 107, uh, to 116 is Johansson's article about how the Westminster Confession of Faith proof texts from the King James. Gardner also makes this the same point on page 105. Um, so I find that to be a, a little bit of a prick to my conscience, because if I use the ESV and uh, it does not have those verses, or at least it puts them in footnotes or in brackets, then uh, it made me wonder about is my subscription to the to the Westminster Confession of Faith is it is it due is it proper is it is it is it in order? So I was a little bit challenged there on that point. Um, I also longed for, as the authors do, a common translation for all English speakers. Now, one thing that was beautiful about the King James Version is if you anywhere you went in the world, uh, if they spoke English, they probably used the King James Version. That was true for a number of generations. It's no longer true. Now, if you look at the younger folks, they're more likely to have perhaps a modern translation, whereas uh, people from yesteryear, of course, they would have had the King James Version. Of course, the King James Version is still highly in use in, use in many churches. And I love the King James Version. But part of me longs for an agreement with the authors that we could all show up at whatever church or whatever Bible study, open our Bibles, follow along with the preacher, because if you spoke English, you were playing off the same text. You had the same playbook in your hand. You had the Holy Scriptures and the same translation. I do long for that. And, and part of it made me a little bit jealous um, that we don't use the King James Version and that I don't preach from the King James Version, because I, I do long for that unity with, with the body of Christ. And then there was a chapter by a guy called Mir, Shah, Mir Shahi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I probably didn't uh, better than the Johannine comma, which I <laughs> mispronounced earlier. He makes a point about apologetic value. Now, one of the challenges to the Christian faith that's commonly brought by, by Muslims is that there are variations in our Greek New Testament manuscripts, a, a challenge that we have to deal with apologetically. 
Uh, Mir Shahi argues that if we would all simply agree to use the Textus Receptus, then we could basically by step the problem of manuscript variations. I'm not sure he's right there because remember the Textus Receptus is a printed uh, post Gutenberg printing press edition of the Greek New Testament. Uh, yes, there's large amount of agreement amongst the various editions of the TR, but even still there's variations between them. So Stephanus and Beza and the Elsevier brothers there are variations between them and in the older Erasmian editions. But I take his point that it would be easier, perhaps, to argue against Islamic scholars that point to the manuscript variations and say, how, how will you deal with this? And so there's a simplicity to simply holding up the TR and saying, this is our text. You can never mind all of the various manuscripts throughout the ages, which had those handwritten variations. Most of those variations, by the way, brought about simply by copyist error. We're talking about spelling mistakes. We're talking about transposed words. Uh, maybe this scribe messes up this spelling or this scribe has the word order a little bit different because Greek can actually change the word order a little bit. Uh, maybe one has this word and another has a synonym for it. We're not talking about major, major variations here. But most of the time, what you can do is you can look at the, uh, the majority text and simply say, well, uh, all of the manuscripts seem to coalesce along this majority line here. And so we can so sort of dismiss the fact that scribes do make mistakes from time to time, as long as we're sticking with the majority of what most of the scribes have agreed upon. And then not only that, but I, I, did, I did feel that the authors of this particular volume were helpful in pointing out the fact that yes, perhaps the critical text the CT, and this is where I've been challenged about this in my own life a little bit, perhaps some of the methodology for discerning how this eclectic a critical text has been posed together has been too overly influenced by secular humanistic scholars. Uh, perhaps we've been uh, too much influenced in our Greek Testament text by the by the German higher critics of the 1800s and, and the 1900s when putting this together. Maybe there are some reasons why it would be better to default back to the consensus agreement of the Reformation era uh, reformers. So all that to say, I thought that the authors made a couple of, of good points. One more, I think, one or two more is that I love the fact that there was an intergenerational feel to some of these articles. Again, a lot of these are personal testimonies, but, but it really warmed my heart. And I did find myself moved when authors would say something to the effect of that they're memorizing some of the same exact same lines that their grandparents memorized from the King James Version and that they're teaching their children the exact same formulation of scripture as they're memorizing and learning the King James Version as well. So that kind of intergenerational passing down our love for and memorization of Holy Scripture from one generation to the next, I did personally find that compelling. Now I want to move on, though, secondly, to some negatives that I, I had when I was reviewing this book. First of all, and I'm going to kind of begin a little bit superficially here, and then maybe we'll go a little bit deeper. I did find the chapters to be a little bit repetitive, okay? I wish Riddle and McShaffrey had done a better job of challenging the contributors to not do the same thing over and over again in their chapters. And when they found that the chapters were, in fact, falling into a predictable pattern, they should have gone back to the contributors and challenged them to stir up some new ideas or to combat it, come, uh, come at it from a different angle because... Yeah, um, I'm going to tell you, in 20 chapters, some of them I felt like I read over and over again, the same arguments and the exact same points, even using the exact same quotation. So let me give you the formula. And then you've pretty much read the book if you hear the formula. So pretty much every chapter, not all of them, but many of them start off with the author saying, I, I grew up on the King James. Uh, I strayed from the King James in college. I got wild. I went with a 1984 NIV. I got crazy out there. And then I realized that there were, there were some mistakes in the translation, or there were a couple of verses that I couldn't find in my King James Version. And so I came back to the King James Version, the authorized version. And then there's always, in every single chapter, a citation from Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, uh, paragraph 8, which we're going to look at here in just a few moments. Or there was a, a quotation of the London Baptist Confession, chapter 1, paragraph 8. 
they all quoted the same paragraph over and over again in full. We're not talking about just referencing it. It seemed like at least a dozen of these 20 authors quoted the same paragraph over and over and over. And then they would go back to uh, um, a, a quotation from John Owen or the same quotation from Francis Turretin. And then they would end up saying, therefore, you too need to reject the modern translations and do what I did, which is embrace the authorized version in the King James Version. So once you've heard that formula, you've heard it a thousand times. So Riddle and McChaffrey, if you're going to do a volume two or you have another idea for another book, please, please, please challenge your authors to not write the same thing over and over again. Now, here's my second negative about this book. Notice the title of this book is not why I preach from the authorized King James Version. The title of this book is why I preach from the received text. And so at the end of the day, we're not necessarily talking about um, preferences for English translations. Although each English translation, of course, has a base text, most of the English translations are either going to be translations of the TR, again, the Reformation era Textus Receptus, of Erasmus, Beza, Stephanus, Elsevier, uh, Scrivener, etc., or their translations from the modern scholarly critical text, which enjoys the support of most of the learned academicians and theologians of our day. Okay, what's startling about this book is that even though it's titled "Why I Preach from the Received Text," which is a reference to the Greek printed text that you're preaching from. There is so little Greek in this book that it is it is very, very frustrating. In fact, there's only one sentence in this entire book that is a Greek sentence. It's on page 200 by one of the contributing editors, Jeff Riddle, actually quoted the Greek. I think there's one other place, maybe one other place where an author used the word amen in Greek. Other than that, brothers, we are not really talking a lot about the Greek text here. There is not a lot of in-depth work here about the Greek text. Brothers, I wanted to get into the Byzantine text form. I wanted to talk about uh, Family 35. I wanted to get in and talk about some of the Alexandrian texts. I wanted you to give me some legitimate critiques about Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and uh, and the Beza text. And I, I wanted way more. I wanted to go deeper. Basically, what I wanted from you is I wanted the introduction and the conclusion to the Robinson Pierpont majority text form edition. That's what I wanted. I wanted a technical level commentary or introduction or even an argument between the various editions of the Greek. What I got instead was a very brief reference to the TR followed by paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of advocation for the King James. Now, I know that biblical con, uh, confessional bibliology has tried so hard to separate them from the King James only movement. However, when what you put together is chapter after chapter, paragraph after paragraph of arguing for the use of the authorized version to the exclusion of every other translation, it ends up coming off like another King James Version only work. And so I, I would say that the authors did not impress me necessarily with their contributions related to the Greek text itself. Now, I'm going to say this, and I hope I don't get in too much trouble, okay, because this is the negative part of the review. I'm looking through the list of all of the contributors here, which I printed from the publisher's website. And I've got to tell you, I've over 20 pastors that contributed chap chapters. Only five of them had MDivs, which is kind of the standard ordination degree, which usually entails study of the Greek and the Hebrew uh, languages to the point of mastery so that you can get ordained and reform denominations. There were only two contributors here that had a PhD or a DMIN. There were more diplomas in this list than I than than a high school graduation. What is a diploma? What is a diploma? I, I honestly, all of these schools that are mentioned here, or at least many of them, I've never heard of. Some of them I Googled and could not find. I could not find a school, for instance, called uh, the Florida Institute of Biblical Studies. I could not find an institute called Golden State School of Theology. Even if I did, I don't know what a DRE degree is. There's a ton of guys that have diplomas. There's a uh, there's guys that have MBAs and degrees in computer science. There's a guy who has a degree in mortuary studies. What I didn't see in the list of contributors is anybody who seems to have real expertise in linguistics or text criticism or even Greek. 
Um, I could be totally wrong. And if I am wrong, I most sincerely apologize. But the authors did not come across as having fully understood the complexities of text criticism. They, they just didn't. They just didn't come across to me as, as having persuasive knowledge of uh, Greek and how complex the issue related to Greek manuscripts actually are. It was far too simplistic and far too superficial. And I don't think that uh, many of the authors impressed me that they have a real comprehension about the, the difficulties of these topics. Now, probably the lowest point for me in this book was the chapter uh, by a, a contributor called Myers. And here, the lowest point, he goes full blast King James Version only. Now, I guess we have to define King James Version onlyism here. It's the idea that not only the King James is the, the best or the preferred text, which everybody has our preferred translation, okay? Uh, maybe I prefer the ESV and you like the NASB, but King James Version onlyism basically suggests that every other version is the, the implement of Satan. They are the devices of Satan. The ESV is satanic. The New King James is satanic. The NASB is satanic. Only the King James Version is a legitimate translation of the Holy Scriptures. In fact, some KJV onlys will go as far as to say you can't even be saved unless you're converted by a King James Version verse of the Bible. Now, obviously, most of the authors here uh, decried that. They said it was. They said that was cultic. They 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 wanted to very clearly distinguish themselves as biblical confessionists or confessional bibliologists. They did not want to ascribe to the label of King James Version only. But in this chapter, the author went full blast KJVO. And uh, let me read you the passage here. He says, modern translations based on Satan's Bible that omit some of the word of God include, and then he names them, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, the English Standard Version, and many others. I thought this was a low point of the book. And honestly, I would expect more from Jeff Riddle and Christian, Christian McShaffrey. When somebody turns in a chapter that arrives at the very conclusions that you're trying to separate yourself from, you should have rejected the chapter and or asked the author for some serious revision. I found the tone there to, compl to be completely uncharitable and misplaced. Um, I, th I think that chapter should not have made it into the anthology, to be completely honest. Moreover, this book is prone towards wild hyperbole. Now, you know what the word hyperbole means, to throw it over, right? Hyper, over, bale, to throw. It's a Greek word. Um, but sometimes King James Version advocates, whether they're KJVO or whether they're just advocates of the King James, they have a tendency to make wild hyperbole overstatements. There are several of these throughout the book. One of them was by Christian McShaffrey himself on page 153. He tells us that there is no reference to the resurrection uh, in Mark's gospel unless we have the longer uh, the longer ending, which is one of the debated passages. Okay, it's one of those passages that the ESV puts in brackets, not footnotes, but brackets. All right, okay, so it's not like it's not in the ESV; it's just in bra brackets with some qualifiers that some of the ancient manuscripts don't have it. But here's what uh, here's what McShaffrey says. He says, does the Lord's Prayer end with a doxology or a reference to the devil? Matthew 6, 13. Do we really have a perfect proof text for the Holy Trinity? 1 John 5, 7. Was God himself manifested in the flesh? 1 Timothy 3, 16. Does the Gospel of Mark actually end with no reference to the resurrection? Mark 16, 9 to 20. Well, a Christian, I know that you must have been making a hyperbole here because obviously, um, even if you didn't, let's say hypothetically, you didn't espouse the longer ending of Mark, you still have here uh, in Mark chapter 16, let's just read verse six. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. So there is a reference to the resurrection, even if the longer ending isn't uh, isn't original. Moreover, you also have references to the resurrection explicitly in Mark 8.31, 9.31, and 10.33, or at least thereabouts. So to say that Mark's gospel has no resurrection is just flat out wrong. I understand what you're trying to do, Christian. You're trying to make a strong statement about how important the resurrection account is. By the way, I myself do hold to the longer ending of Mark. I think it's, I think it's original. I think it's authentic. I think it's canonical. 
but you overstayed the overstated the case and you overplayed your hand when you mistakenly said, and it's easily disproved that Mark has no reference to the resurrection if the longer ending is not included. Um, there's another wild hyperbole here on page 69 with the chapter by de Geer. He's quoting Francis Turretin here. So this is not de Geer's own words, but in Francis Turretin, he says that all the Greek copies have the comma, uh, the John, John's comma, I keep messing that up, the, uh, the jo Johannine comma, right? He says all the Greek manuscripts have it. That is so easily disproved. Um, actually, it's much closer to none of the Greek manuscripts have it. Erasmus was only able to find one, which is why he did include it in his subsequent revisions of his, his earlier uh, Greek texts. The original 1516 did not have it, as you already know. It was later put in when he found one very, very late, perhaps even contemporary, not sure, hard to date it, manuscript that did have 1 John 5-7. Um, but to include this is is just factually wrong. Francis Turton may have very well believed it. Francis Turton may have very well seen some manuscripts uh, that have it. He may have heard from another scholar that they all have it. I'm not challenging the fact that Francis Turton said this. What I'm challenging is that all the Greek copies have it because that is so easily disproved that it should not have been included in your chapter. If you intentionally included a false statement, knowing the contrary, just because the author is reputable, right, then basically you've 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 used the, the informal fallacy of authority. You've cited an authority just because he said it, we're supposed to believe it. But the fact of the matter is, it's simply not true. Look at the preponderance of the Greek manuscripts. You will not find John's comma in there. It's just simply not. Um, it is in the Latin, it is in the Vulgate, but it's certainly not in all of the Greek manuscripts. And to say that it is when you know that it's not, and it's so easily disproved, it hardly need to be reinforced. Uh, I found that to be intellectually dishonest. Um, here's one more, and I think Dane Johansson is a, is a good guy. I've had some good interactions with him online, but on page 113, he makes the statement that the authorized version, again, notice the conflation here between the received text and the authorized version, is the standard of all Reformed Bible preaching. He doesn't qualify that, but I think my good friend Johansson misses the point that the entire Reformation was not English speaking, that there was there was German speaking Reformers and Puritans, uh, there was Dutch speaking, French speaking, the, the Reformed movement, let's say, is much broader than just the authorized version of 1611. And, and not only that, but uh, that's anachronistic to even say that because this, the authorized version is 1611, but the, many of the reformers came long, long before it. Okay. So I, I just found that to be a wild hyperbole. Again, I understand the point that you're trying to make that the, the, uh, the authorized version, the AV or the King James version has a significant effect, let's say, or a very important role, but to say that it's a standard of all reformed preaching, that's 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 just going too far. Not only that, but the incessant use of Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter one, paragraph eight. Uh, this is the line that it's been preserved in all ages, right? But they constantly use this text in an anachronistic way. Now, let's remember that the Westminster Confession of Faith was written in 1646, 47 with the proof text, right? Um, but to suggest that the authors, the Westminster divines, were arguing against the critical text, which didn't come about until the late 1800s, right? That is anachronistic. And so what the reformers were actually arguing against was against the Roman Catholic preference to the Latin, which is why Westminster Confession, chapter 1, paragraph 8, talks about the Greek and the Hebrew, because the reformers did appeal to the authority of the Greek and the Hebrew as over against the Latin Vulgate. But the way that the authors of this volume use Confession of Faith, chapter 1, uh, paragraph 8, it's as though the reform, the, uh, the authors of the Confession are choosing the, the TR, the received text, as over against the critical text. That's the way they quote and cite the paragraph. But I think it's anachronistic to do that. And I realize that some of the Bas Baptist um, Reformed guys that are contributors to, contributors to this volume, they don't have presbyteries to appeal to. Uh, so their views never had to be tested by a presbytery when they go to be ordained. But I would I would challenge the Presbyterian brothers if you if you believe that that is what the confession is stating that the confession itself is arguing that we must use the TR. 
I would I would simply go to your presbytery and ask if that's the consensus way that your presbytery interprets the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm going to argue that uh, probably in most presbyteries, they will not say that that's the point of the Westminster Confession of Faith in that particular cha chapter and paragraph. And so what we end up here in this book is a constant conflation between two ideas. We are conflating or confusing what is the Textus Receptus, the Greek printed Reformation era editions of the New Testament with the King James Version itself, which is the English translation of the TR. And so the authors will constantly use these two things interchangeably as though they are in fact the same thing. So sometimes in a certain paragraph, an author will start off talking about the Textus Receptus and then move into talking an application to the King James Version as though those are exactly the same thing. The conflation happens so much, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a shell game where you're talking about one thing and then you present to me the other, such that the, the overall tone of the book is that if you're not preaching from the King James Version or the authorized version, you're not being faithful to the confession of faith. And I, I just didn't find that convincing myself. Not only that, but throughout this book, there uh, is another fallacy that's taking place, and that is the false dilemma fallacy, where you're forcing your reader to make a choice between two different things as, as though these were the only two options. So throughout the book, they're arguing for the TR as over against the critical text, the modern scholarly academic text, as though these are the only two options, which is something like going out on any given day and say it's either raining or it's snowing. But that's a that's a false dilemma fallacy because it might be doing neither. So one of the possible solutions to these difficulties is neither the TR nor the CT. It is the majority text position. And again, um, having done a little bit of study now on the majority text, Robinson, Pierpont, et cetera, I find that the majority text solution, which is the consensus agreement of, of all of the uh, New, New Testament manuscripts, the large agreement that exists between them, especially in the Byzantine text form, that may be the solution um, to this problem. In fact, I think there's a lot of reasons where it's why it's very compelling. And perhaps in another video subsequently to this, I will make an argument, an extended argument for why the majority text may actually toe the line perfectly between the TR and the CT. It may in fact be the most authentic edition of the Greek New Testament. Okay, so altogether, I would suggest that they change the title for this book. It certainly does not do enough to argue for the received text because mostly they're talking about the King James Version. They should have just been honest in the title of the book and call it Why I Preach from the King James Version. If they would have called it that or Why I Preach from the Authorized Version, you wouldn't have even had to change even a chapter. The whole book would have made a lot more sense to a lot of people, and then there wouldn't be a lot of disappointment that they they failed to arrive at the conclusions from which their premises argue. Okay. Now, um, I want to ask some honest questions. So I did a little bit of positive and a little bit of negative. Now I have some actual questions for you. And I am most sincerely asking these questions. I would very much like to know the answers. Unfortunately, none of these chapters gave me the answers that I was looking for. And so I'm going to throw this out there, that if anybody in the biblical uh, confession camp or the confessional bibliology camp wants to answer these questions for me, again, I am willing to sit at your feet and learn from you and listen to you as my brother and my father. First question for you, please answer this. Why is there no love for the New King James Version in this book? In fact, um, everywhere you will read against the New King James. Now, again, the title is Why I Preach from the Received Text. And the New King James Version, the NKJV, is a translation from the TR. The New King James Version is translated from exactly the same Greek base text as the authorized version. And yet throughout the book, what we get is nothing but disparagement for the New King James Version. So for instance, on page 127, we're told that it's filled with contradictions. On page 154, we're told that it's not accurate. On page 172, we're told that it undermines the text. On page 201, we're told that it has problems. And on page 223, we're told that it raises doubts. And so if we are honestly arguing that we should preach from the received text or the TR, 
then there should be theoretically no problem with the new King James Version since it is in fact translated from the same base text as the King James. But throughout the book, there's a running theme to reject the new King James and instead embrace only the authorized version or the King James. I would love to hear why we didn't include any authors that preach from the new King James, why there was nothing positive said about the new King James version. Perhaps I think McShaffrey said that he used it for a bit, doesn't say much positive or negative against it. Practically every time the New King James Version is mentioned, it is in the form of derogation. It is being dismissed. Uh, it is being uh, belittled in some way. My question to you, why is that? Second question, I don't understand the obsession with brackets and footnotes. Um, the authors of this book, and I've listened to some of the YouTube um, videos and the podcast by authors, editors, contributors to this book, they constantly mock and deride brackets and footnotes as though uh, they don't have anything meaningful to contribute. Now, usually what they do is they'll take a section uh, like John 753 to 8, 8 and following, the woman caught in adultery, uh, the pericope adulteri, or they'll take the longer ending of Mark. Um, and they'll make a statement like this. These are not contained in the modern editions, especially those translated from the critical text. And yet I go to my Bible and I open them up and I find that the longer ending of Mark is in my Bible. In fact, so is the pericope adulteri. They're there in my Bible. The thing though, is that my Bible has brackets to, uh, to alert me to the fact that it's not in some of the oldest manuscripts, or sometimes there's footnotes. There are several verses that are put as footnotes to the Bible, but apparently those don't count. And my question is why? Now, where I did um, my education, I did not go to the, uh, what is this called here? The Golden State School of Theology or the Florida Institute of Biblical Studies. I'm not sure if those exist anymore. Um, but when I turned in my papers, the footnotes were part of the paper. Okay, so your footnotes are graded as part of the paper that you turn in. When I write books and I submit them to the publisher, the footnotes are part of the book. And so this constant beating of the drum that the modern translations and the critical text translations cut these out of the Bible or they're removed from the Bible or they're missing from the Bible. And yet I look up my Bible and they're there. They're just in brackets or in footnotes. Like, I don't understand. Why is that the kryptonite that that seems to terrify every a confessional bibliologist? And yet, ironically, very somewhat quite ironically, I was listening to a podcast by Jeffrey Riddle recently where he's defending his interpretation of Psalm 12.6 from the King James Version, as you might expect. And in order to make his argument, he actually went to one of the footnotes of the authorized version, <laughs> the footnote related to him or them in the Hebrew of that text, uh, let the reader understand. He has to make his argument based on a footnote reading from the King James Version. And so my question is, why is that allowed? And yet other versions are Satan's Bible. If they merely alert me to the fact that some manuscripts or the older manuscripts or the best manuscripts, whatever they say, don't have those, those verses. If they're there in the footnote, in my view, they are there in the Bible. They have not been cut out. And I will argue this, that if you go back um, through the manuscripts, you'll very often find that some of, some of the scribes make these kinds of notes in their manuscripts. In fact, Erasmus's text comes with uh, footnotes and explanations and marginal material, making these same kinds of, of uh, explanations. And so even going back to the discussion between St. Augustine and Jerome, there's several letters that you can read between Augustine and Jerome when Jerome was uh, translating the Septuagint, the Greek edition of the Old Testament, into the Latin. Um, Jerome apparently used obelisks and uh, some asterisks to identify what was in the Greek versus what was in the Hebrew. Augustine asks him, please make sure to continue that practice. That's very helpful. So the one thing we know is that the Christian church has a very long history, both in the scribal tradition and in the early church, of using these kinds of materials to alert readers to possible variations in the readings. My question is, why does every biblical confessionist or confessional bibliologist uh, get weak like every other man, like Samson when his hair is cut, when a bracket or a footnote shows up? In my view, that's just the scholarly and the academic and the intellectually honest way of alerting the reader to the fact that, yes, in the manuscripts, we do have difficulties. Next question. And you are going to have to answer this question. 
Um, Dane Johansson tells us on page 108 that this is a tertiary question that confessional bibliology does not have to deal with. I completely agree with my brother Johansson that this is a tertiary question. This is the question. The question is which edition of the TR is the one? If you are arguing, as you did throughout this entire book, that the TR, the Texas Receptus, has every jot and tittle right. And believe me, uh, this is one of the, the, the hyperbolic statements, the hyperboles that is rife throughout this entire work, that the TR has every jot and tittle. And they'll even say things like down to the letter, even down to the grammatical word order. McShaffrey makes that argument. Um, if every single jot and tittle is absolutely correct in the TR, and everything else is to be rejected or it's Satan's Bible or whatever else it is, then you have to answer the question, which edition of the TR? And that is the very issue that nobody in the uh, confessional bibliology movement seems to have the audacity to answer. And I'm challenging you on that. Again, you cannot put this off as though it's a tertiary question when it is in fact the question. In fact, what we're going to look here on the screen is a couple of editions that you can't say are the one for various reasons. First of all, uh, no adherent to the King James Version will tell you that it's the 1516, the original edition of the TR, the one that Erasmus did first as he's competing to get it to print against the Complutensian polyglot, polyglot because this does not have John's comma, 1 John 5, 7 in there. So nobody will say it's the original one. Nor will they say that it's the 1598, which was one of Beza's versions, even though the King James translators apparently relied on this one the most. And the reason that they can't say that is because the King James version doesn't agree with the 1598 in a number of places, because they used other uh, TR manuscripts and they used other even English translations, the Bishop's Bible, for instance, as they're putting together the, the, the King James version. So they can't say the 1598. So you'd think it would be the 1894, the Scrivener text, uh, which is the one that the Trinitarian Bible Society puts out. Why don't you just come out and say it? For goodness sakes, just tell us that it's the Scrivener edition. And I'll tell you why they can't do that. And that is because they know that Scrivener himself says that he, he intentionally collated this edition so that it would agree in conformity to the King James Version. So there is a sense in which this has been reverse engineered to match exactly with the AV or the King James Version. And so they know that. And so they can't say that it's this one. Not only that, but this is super, super late in the game. In fact, uh, this is contemporary with Westcott and Hort, right? And they've been telling us all along that Westcott and Hort are way too late in the game, okay? And so it would be super ironic if they chose as the Jot and Tittles text, the 1894 when it's contemporary to the very editions that they're accusing of being a novelties and far too late in redemption history to be the one. Okay, so Dane, uh, Jeffrey, Christian, at some point, one of you is going to have to get bold and to answer this question, which one is the TR? Again, if your entire argument rests on the fact that the TR has every jot and tittle correctly, then you owe it to the world. We're waiting to hear an answer. Which edition is the one? I've told you why you can't say three of them. Pick another one and let us know because we're all dying to hear. Question, why can the TR be revised so many times, but other Greek texts and translations cannot? Okay, now this is kind of ironic. Again, because let me go back to this previous screen. Here's all the various editions of the TR. And if you go to BibleResearcher.com, there's even a long page in which they'll show you all of the variations between these editions of the TR. I get it. They're very, 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 very similar, but there are differences between them, okay? And so what you're telling us is that the TR went through a number of different editions in which things were tweaked or improved or modified, or I'm not going to use the word evolved because I don't like that word sharpened, let's say, uh, as the TR comes out through its various editions, why don't you extend that luxury to, for instance, the critical text? So one of the main knocks that you're going to hear against the critical text is, well, how many editions is there going to be? Uh, there's the fourth edition of the UBS, and they're like on edition 28 of the Nestle Alland. Uh, what do we need? 29 editions. So there's always kind of this, uh, this negative derogation against the number of iterations of the critical text as though it's constantly changing and things like that. But hey, so did the TR. The TR went through a number of iterations. In fact, ironically, it's almost approximate. At least one person said it's almost like 27, 28 iterations of the TR. 
So why does the TR get to get sharpened or modified or improved 20, 28 times and other texts don't get to do that? Same thing with the King James. We know that the current King James version we have in our Bibles today has modifications, improvements, agreements in spelling, things like that, uh, some minor grammar updates. I'm not saying it's a lot, but it but it is it is enough to be noticeable amongst the very editions of the King James Version throughout the generations. Why can't modern translations do the same thing? Why do you afford your text and translation the opportunity to improve and to sharpen and to make corrections over time, but you uh, you deride and reject other texts and translations for doing the very same thing? Question. I really wanted the answer to this. Nobody gave it to me. Why does the TR retain Latin Vulgate readings that are not found in the majority text? Now, personally, I, I thought that this book was at its strongest when it was making majority text related arguments. In other words, I find that to be rationally convincing. I, I too want to be in the mainstream, the majority text stream of what Christians have always had in their Bibles. But as you know, and as I know, the text recept Textus Receptus has readings that are not majority text readings. In fact, one of your own champions, one of your own champions, the writer Edward F. Hills, who is certainly Reformed, studied under Machen and Van Til, he wrote this book, The King James Version Defended, which uh, you cite in your appendix as one of the great works to be consulted. And yet, um, in this textbook, Hills gives us pages of readings which are in the TR but are not in the majority text. They come from the Latin Vulgate. And so if you're arguing that it's confessional to go beyond the Latin Vulgate back to the Greek and the Hebrew texts, why then does the text, this Receptus, retain these readings which are not majority text readings? And he cites a number of them, Matthew 10, 8, Matthew 27, 35, John 3, 25, Acts 8, 37, Acts 9, 5, Acts 9, 6, Acts 20, 28, Romans 16, 25 to 27, Revelation 22, uh, verse 19. So that's that's a lot, okay? And my question to you is, if if you're, you're going to say that other Bible versions are faulty um, for various reasons, including not having the right verses in them, why does the Texas Receptus retain these traditional Latin Vulgate readings when it's demonstrably sure that they're not also majority text readings? Okay, that's a question. I'd love to hear that answered. Moreover, um, I'm not sure you really read the entirety of the paragraph Westminster Confession 1.8. Now, every single writer quoted this or the London Baptist Confession of Faith. But I'm not sure you read the whole paragraph because nobody dealt with the last part of the paragraph. It says, by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages and are therefore authentical, so as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal unto them. Agreed. But because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God, and then we're going to just skip a little bit here for the sake of brevity so I can get this all on the screen, therefore they are to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation into which they come. Question, what does the word vulgar mean? Um, does that not mean something like uh, what Koine Greek meant, the language on the street? Does not that mean something like the idea that that's what's spoken in contemporary society? Is that not the idea of the plowboy? Isn't that the idea that this is the language that normal people actually speak in everyday language? And if that's what the word vulgar means, then of all of the translations which don't comport to Westminster Confession 1.8, it would be the King James. Because the King James Version, I think as Mark Ward has adequately shown in his book Authorized, has a number of readings which no longer meet the intelligibility test today. And some readings, which, uh, what does he call them? Uh, false friends. You think you understand what the word means, but it's changed meanings over time. And it actually in, unintentionally misleads the modern reader because the word itself has changed meanings, okay? So of all of the Bible translations that could rightly be considered vulgar, you would think that the King James Version is the one Bible that doesn't meet that standard. Perhaps we might go to other antiquated versions like the Geneva Bible or others to say so. But you would think then that I would be led to the conclusion that the new King James Version, if you're right about singular care and providence, meaning the TR, and I'm not sure that you are, 
uh, then it also has to meet the vulgarity standard. And I don't think that the AV actually does. In fact, one of your authors, in fact, a couple of your authors even acknowledged, let's see here, on pages 70 and 103, that the King James Version is not colloquial English. And at least one person suggested that it'll probably have to be revised at some point because of the intelligibility issue. Okay. So what's what's my final conclusion here at the end of this book review? Well, I definitely learned a lot. And um, I can agree with you that I, I now have more concerns about humanistic enlightenments, presuppositions of critical text, um, higher critical scholars than I did before. You've alerted me to that. I'm thinking more about these things. So I do thank you and appreciate that from you. I've also been quite convinced, let's say, by a number of arguments related to the majority text position, which I think is 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 very compelling. The Byzantine text form is something that I'm going to continue to research and to look into for, uh, for the near future. So at the end of the day, I think we're left with this. The authors tell us that they are not King James Version only. They deny it explicitly, and I thank them for it. I think it's a good thing to make space between biblical confessionalism, confessional bibliology, and King James Version onlyism. So that's denied, and I'll take you at your word. However, I do think then you kind of run into this problem of being what I'm going to call PKJVO, which is practical King James Version only. At the end of the day, having read this book, one would arrive at the conclusion that practically the only version that is acceptable is the authorized or the King James Version. Every other translation that is brought up at some point or another is eventually dismissed as being irrelevant or inaccurate or at worst, Satan's Bible. Again, I thought that was the low point of the entire book. And so to be gracious and charitable in my interpretation, I'm going to say that this is not, at the end of the day, a defense of King James onlyism, but it is a defense of practical King James Version onlyism. In other words, there's only one good Bible translation, and that is the King James Version. Um, a conclusion that at this point in my life, I cannot say that I agree with. All right. Well, thank you so much for checking into this long video. I apologize for the length. Maybe I'll do a shorter edition of this as well. I'm going to place a, a link to this book in the description of this video so you can get it if you want it, as well as some of the other articles, the chapters, books, things like that, that I mentioned throughout this video. Thank you so much for checking. And I do love you lots. And we'll talk to you later.